can uh, we can start your part of the meeting i'd just like to um give you a very big welcome um ian is going to talk to us tonight about the dormouse reintroduction program in nottinghamshire ian is a member of the people's trust for endangered species and i understand this is a charitable organization founded in 1977 um, which deals in science-led conservation of rare and endangered species and habitats. I understand their activities cover wildlife surveys, mammal monitoring, dormice, water voles, hedgehogs, mammals on roads, ponds. It seems to me, you name it, you seem to cover quite a lot of things. So tonight we're talking about dormice. I'm really looking to, uh, forward to hearing you talk, Ian. So. Um, very welcome. Um, if we were in the room, we would all clap at this point. But if you'd like to um, share your screen, I can see people clapping, share your screen and uh, off we go. <laughs> yeah, certainly. Well, thank, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I'll just make it, add a couple of bits. Am I not muted? No. I'll uh, just add a couple of bits to that in terms of, we're actually even bigger than you suggest to be honest. We're actually an international organisation. Oh, right. um, we fund research um, around the world. Uh, obviously on species of conservation concern, but we provide, I think over the last, you know, we provide considerable sums of money. We do fund anything pretty much from seahorses to snow leopards to uh, to uh, giraffes in Africa. So we, our, our remit is very broad uh, and our focus in the UK tends to be on more on mammals. Um, we do, we're doing a lot of work on hedgehogs, most certainly, so it's interesting to hear the, the uh, people's views on hedgehogs or the, the experience of people with hedgehogs. Um, and from my point of view, I have to say I'm not a member, I'm a full-time employee for Pe People's Trust for Endangered Species and I've been there for since 2006, so it seems quite a long time. Um, I'm also very fortunate in that I've worked on hazel dormice for probably about 20 years now. Um, and it, I only work on hazel dormice, I don't work on anything else. Um, so yeah, it's quite a nice position to be in. So, uh, I think if you're if you're going to pick a species, um, I think uh, yeah, hazel dormice is a pretty good one to uh, to, to go for. Um, I, I, what I wanted to talk about, let's just see about sharing my screen. Like that. Yeah. We okay. can we can see all your slides down the side. That's yeah, better. that should be better. Yeah, yeah that's better. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Yeah. So I, I pretty much manage or PTS are the lead conservation charity on dormice in the UK. Um, and I, 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 so I work full, I work full time on dormice and managing the dormice reintroduction program is just one element of my job, but quite a significant one. Um, so what I want to talk about tonight, I think you asked me to talk about the uh, Nottinghamshire one specifically, but the reality is, is you, you can't really talk about Nottingham without giving you a, trying to give you a bit better understanding how the process works. So before I can even start doing that, I, I, I need to assume that, that uh, or I need to give you some information on dormice. So I'll try and keep that fairly brief, um, but dormice are very much a habitat specialist. Um, long thought that they were kind of closely associated with um, a hazel woodland, and it's true they are, but it's by no means the only habitat that they occupy. Two things really drive all of dormouse ecology. One is that they lack a cecum, and the cecum is uh, the fermenting part of the gut that allows uh, animals to digest cellulose. Because dormice don't have a cecum, that inhibits their ability to digest cellulose, which means they're a specialist feeder. So they're feeding on nectar, they're feeding on pollen, they're feeding on invertebrates, and then come the autumn, they're feeding on fruit, nuts, and berries that you get in the autumn. But what that means is there's, they cannot rely on any one food supply um, because uh, plants will only be flowering for a limited period of time. Um, so they, they need to have a successional a uh, series of plants that allows them to feed and keep them, um, um, or they can, can provide them for food in their active period. So one of the consequences of being a, a specialist feeder is, is when you get to, uh, to, to winter, there's, there's no food available. So you can either cache food, as mice do, or, or you hibernate, which is what dormice do. So they cache food, but they cache it in their body. So one of the consequences of hibernation is that means they're not wearing their body down at such a, a such a, a fast rate as, as other small rodents. Um, so they, they tend to be quite long-lived. They can live up to three years in the wild uh, or 
they generally live up to three years in the wild, they can live up to five years, and they have been known to live up to seven years in captivity. Um, and also the fact that they hibernate means that reduces the period that they can breed. So generally dormice will only have one litter a year, um, and, and that's usually about four young. So, so, so they, they don't produce very many dormice, so this is a, a species that always lives at relatively low population densities. The other thing the dormice are is they're arboreal, and we've all kind of seen grey squirrels bouncing around in the tree trop, treetops, um, but grey squirrels are a much larger animal. Dormice are only about uh, two inches or 50 millimetres long, um, and they're, they're quite small. And actually, uh, given they're arboreal, it's quite a difficult and tricky habitat to get around in. And it doesn't actually exist in very many places because it's not good enough just to have a few trees around. You need an interconnected network of branches to enable the, uh, the animals to get around and find food and find mates. And you also require similar, of course, to allow them to disperse into the wider landscape. So as I say, this is very much a habitat specialist of kind of uh, old and ancient woodlands because that's an area where they will have this broad variety of food, um, but, and also, you need good habitat connectivity. Uh, I suppose that the best way to think of the habitat, there, there are species of early successional vegetation. So that's the stuff, if you cut some woodland down, that's the stuff that comes back. Um, once you've cut wood down, that's the stuff that starts to regrow. So they're kind of, an, uh, say, an early successional shrubby um, occupier. <coughs> that's what, that's the, the sort of habitat they tend to live in. So we know, almost probably know quite a lot about dormice really. We certainly know where they were, um, over 100 years ago because there was an article published in a magazine called The Zoologist uh, in 1885 that, that basically showed that dormice were pretty much, well they were widespread um, through England, Wales and the only counties they were lacking from uh, according to the rope study was uh, Norfolk and in Northumberland. Otherwise pretty much um, as I say, fairly widespread from the southern counties of England right up to the borders of Scotland. Um, always more concentrated in the southern counties, but that's predominantly where, where the highest density of, wood, of uh, woodlands has been as well. But um, there's a survey started being done in the kind of its, um, late 70s, early 80s, that suggested that dormice had been lost from a large part of the country. And that's been reinforced with, with recent data and data leading up to now that basically dormice have been lost from most Midland and Northern counties. They're still considered frequent in the Southern counties where you can see those, those red areas there. Um, but as you move further north, the numbers and the populations start to decrease quite rapidly. And the most northerly population now is in Cumbria. And as I say, it looks quite good with that whole of Cumbria coloured in. Um, but the reality is there is only one known native population of dormice in Cumbria. And of course, if we lose that, then you're restricting the range again by a further 200 miles. Mm -hmm. So this is a species in fairly, certainly from a range point of view, in, in, in relatively chronic decline. Um, but most of the, or a lot of dormice work was done in the, in the 80s and up to, up to the 90s by a couple of Pat Morris and Paul Grant. And one of the things they set up was the NDMP, the National Dormice Monitoring Programme. So this involves putting a number of dormouse nest boxes up in the woodland. These are then checked on a regular basis, and this information is fed back to people's trust for endangered species. I call it a trained public survey because dormice are highly protected. They're protected under the Wildlife and Countryside Act and the Habitat Regulations, um, so they're a highly protected species, and it's illegal to disturb uh, the habitat or the resting place. And of course, if you're checking dormice boxes, you are potentially disturbing a resting place of dormice. That is illegal without a license from Natural England or Natural Resources Wales. And the NDMP was set up really to monitor the, the population trend of dormice uh, in the UK. And the news has not been good really over since the year 2000. Uh, we've lost 51% of our dormice. So we've lost over half our dormice just in 20 years. Um, so the populations have declined quite substantially, and as I say, the range has declined as well. And we, we now produce a state of Britain's dormice uh, every three years. Um, so the one in 2019 was the second one that, that linked into a, a national dormice conference at the same time. But that was the headline, headline report that dormice numbers have declined by, by over 50% since the year 2000. And the reason is why, well, I, I think it's relatively, um, it hasn't changed much from the, the early work of Pat Morris and Paul Bright. Um, they investigated declines of dormouse and their conclusion was that it was a lack of appropriate woodland management, that successional woodland layers that, that, that benefit dormice and where dormice occupy. At one time that was very prevalent in woods when woods were worked much more, 
um, almost after the Second World War, the, the management we had in our woodlands um, declined quite rapidly. Um, and if now many of our woodlands, the value of them is for people going to walk their dogs uh, or for, 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 um, for uh, large timber extraction, um, not really for management of a scrub understory. So woodland management or inappropriate woodland management is certainly impacting on dormouse numbers. The other problem is habitat fragmentation. As I said, dormice are an arboreal species. So even if they're, they're, they're occupying a woodland, and occupying a woodland well, they still need an opportunity to disperse. And that's often through linear woodlands or the hedgerow network. And our hedgerows in, in many parts of the country don't look particularly great. Um, a lot of the farmer attitude is that they want to, 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 to keep the hedgerows neat and, 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 and cut on a regular basis so they look nice and look tidy. But the problem is if you keep cutting hedgerows at the, at the same level year after year after year, that starts to uh, negatively impact on the hedgerow and, and they start to become either die off or start to become gappy. And once they start to become gappy, they're no good as a corridor for dormice or other species as well, I should say. And finally, climate change is potential impact. Uh, so dormice are a species that hibernate. Uh, and I'll get asked that, but how dormice fared? Has it been a bad winter? Well, a bad winter to dormice is good because a bad winter usually means it's been very cold for a long period of time. That's absolutely fine for dormice because uh, they can hibernate and they can get through that. The problem is change over winter. So if you have a period of warm weather, um, that may wake dormice up. If you then go into a period of cold weather, they have to go into hibernation again. Another period of warm weather may bring them out of hibernation. And it's that potentially moving in and out of hibernation over the course of winter um, that will mean these, the animals will waste energy, um, both on waking up and going back into hibernation again. And of course, they can only do that so many times. Further impact of climate change is we may well be getting wetter springs, wetter summers, and both of those seem to impact on uh, the, the dormouse ability to breed. Uh, so if we, if we have a wet spring, um, they, they will start struggle to, to find sufficient food and they will struggle to, to, to uh, reach suitable condition uh, to breed. So three main factors, woodland management, habitat fragmentation and climate change are all kind of negatively impacting on dormouse populations in the UK. But there are other factors as well. I kind of think uh, there's like so much of our wildlife, I have to say it's, it's almost death by a thousand cuts. Um, deer populations, whilst they don't predate on dormice directly, uh, they pretty much will eat the successional vegetation you're trying to create as a dormouse habitat. Um, grey squirrels, um, they, uh, they will occasionally predate on dormice, but obviously they also feed and, and eat huge numbers of, uh, of um, hazelnuts. That is, a, that is an important food source for dormice. I seem to be seeing more and more uh, pictures of, of, of cat killed. Um, dormice seem to get sent to me. Um, and that's obviously when there's more and more development in southern England, uh, more and more people living close to ancient woodlands where dormice live or can occupy, and cats will have an impact as well. And also boar and badger, again, um, over winter when dormice are hibernating on the ground, they potentially rummage and end up in the undergrowth looking for food. And if they come across a hibernating dormouse, it's just quite a nice little um, protein snack. And all these species have been increasing over the last sort of 20 years or so. Um, and I'd say it's just kind of uh, adds to the problems of, of, of dormice. Uh, and there's been various reports on all this, and this is one I pulled out a report from uh, Plant Life on, in 2011, and they, just after the war, 49% of broadleaf woodland was classed as coppice or scrub, which is where the areas of dormice occupied, and 51% is high forest. By 2002, the high forest represented 97% of the broadleaf resource, so you've got a chronic loss of habitat for, for dormice, but also for other species that live in that scrubby type habitat, like woodland birds, woodland butterflies, and woodland bats as well. And also there's been, I mean, this is a hedgerow not far from me, uh, down in Hampshire, and uh, this is not atypical of many hedgerows you see throughout the country. Uh, hedgerows planted and put in probably using uh, agro-environment schemes, uh, so the farm's been paid money to put a hedge in. Would you call that a hedge? Because I don't think I would. Uh, it's pretty much a, a plant still in tree stakes. It's already starting to be flailed. Um, that, that's not a hedge. And one of the comments from, from a recent book on the natural history of the hedgerow uh, commented that hedges continue to decrease in quality, if not in quantity. And I think that's very true. We've planted an awful lot of hedges, but they're not great hedges by any means. So that's all kind of the problems facing dormice. And the dormice reintroduction program is, is one of the elements that we use to, to that we use in 
not really to restore the dormouse population, but more to, to, to look to restore the range. And there are other benefits to it as well. So Dormouse Reintroduction Programme um, came in as part of the Species Recovery Programme led by Natural England. And the idea is to halt the decline of species and to increase populations and extend the range of, of, of species whose populations were either falling or who had a range contraction. Why reintroduce? Well, I've already kind of alluded to the fact that, that Dormice need um, good arboreal linkage to disperse and, and, and get around. And obviously things like roads, railways, uh, the fragmentation of a habitat is going to make it very hard for the Dormice to disperse and move across the landscape. Uh, and simply they don't travel very far either. And so it's possible that a Dormouse, um, a juvenile Dormouse may disperse up to a, a kilometre or so in good habitat. Um, but if it's uh, if it has a, there's a poor winter, well, this this context I mean poor, you know, variable winter, the population could be ebbing and flowing um, before it starts to get established to, uh, further afield. In, if as long as the habitat's that's good, so for dormice to reoccupy areas from which they've been lost is actually is is unusual to say the least. So that's the reason we, we reintroduce dormice. Um, and one of the things that is useful from a dormice point of view is we already have the National Dormice Monitoring Programme set up and it's been running since 1990. But we can use that as a tool to monitor dormice populations at reintroduction sites over the long term. So we, we, we don't have to set up a new monitoring programme for a reintroduction site. We have something already in place that, that we can just feed into, which is, which is quite useful. So the basic requirements of a, of a, a dormouse reintroduction is, is fairly straightforward, to be honest, or in principle, is fairly straightforward. You need a he healthy dormouse population, which, to be fair, is a dormouse breed quite happily in captivity, and we we have we have no shortage of people wishing to breed and wishing to get involved in that part of the program. Um, we can make sure they're healthy because they go to um, Zoological Society of London and Paynton Zoo to have a quarantine to make sure that when we're releasing dormice, we're not releasing any nasties out into the, out into the environment. Um, so that, that side is, is, is fairly well sorted out. It's actually quite easy. This is a species, it's very easy to get a, a good group of enthusiastic, enthusiastic volunteers involved with. People really like to get involved with, with dormice um, and, are, and are usually very keen and enthusiastic to help. Um, and of course, as I say, it's, if you're certainly looking to reintroduce, reintroduce in some of the northern counties, you, the, the people involved in such a program, um, if they're wildlife, if they're interested in wildlife at all, of course, that will be the only population pretty much in the county. So, it, yeah, it's quite quite a nice thing to be involved with. Um, the biggest problem is the third one: the suitable woodland to release them into. Um, because what you need is ideally a woodland that is in a good condition for dormice now and will remain in, in a good condition for the foreseeable future. Um, and that is the hard bit. It's hard to get that commitment um, and it's hard to get that kind of assurance that that, that will happen. Um, so actually it's, it's the woodland that's just trying to get suitable habitat for them that will both maintain a population now and continue to maintain a population into the future. <coughs> So how it used to start, as I say, the first reintroduction was done in 1993, and what it used to be was pretty much we would release a number of dormice into a site. So here you can see the release site. Um, I'm calling this woodland site A. So you do a release in, in, into a site, and you would hope that dormice would uh, a survive, um, slowly occupy the site, and then once they'd occupied all available niches in that site, they would then start to disperse uh, out of the woodland and out into the wider landscape through the hedgerow network. That was the principle and that was the idea. And, and there were some, and certainly some teething problems, uh, to say the least. But I have to say that that, that, that approach has worked. Here's a, 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 an example. This is a woodland, um, Linford Wood near Mil just north of Milton Keynes. Um, that's the M1 motorway going through the middle of that map. So this was a, a reintroduction done in 1998. Um, Interestingly, links dormice into younger stage woodland. So the reintroduction was done where you can see all those green dots, which basically is a map of all the boxes that were put in the woodland at the time. So this is a 40 hectare woodland owned by the uh, local wildlife trust. And um, half of the wood was felled, clear felled in 1986. So that's 20 hectares of, in essence, of woodland was clear felled. And the reintroduction got put in in 1998 when half of that woodland was 12 years old. So they had a peak count of dormice of 117 in 2004, so that's 18 years later. Um, 
and in the last three years we've had no Dormice report at all. So as actually as the wood starts to age, um, the, the Dormice numbers either decline or simply don't turn up in boxes or the population declines quite dramatically. But um, Dormice had at that stage headed down that, that hedge line you can see coming out, the, out of the northern corner of the wood and they then moved and headed down and they were occupying the um, the uh, bank or the embankment alongside the, the M1. Uh, and there are also wrecks of them turning up on the other side as well. So it looks like they might have crossed the M1 underneath the conduit. So, and, and, and motorway embankments potentially are very, very good habitats for dormice. So this, this is an example where that early kind of approach worked. Um, they'd occupied woodland and uh, over time they had filled all available niches and then they dispersed uh, and they would, they say, then made it out into the M1 and they were occupying that side of the M1. That then, of course, brought a more recent problem because uh, over the last year or so, they've been actually looking to upgrade the uh, M1 to a uh, to a smart motorway, um, and they had to close the motorway down for 12 nights. And I must admit, I had three rather unpleasant media interviews where I thought they were going to be talking about the success of releasing dormice um, in Buckinghamshire. Instead, it was more the uh, radio interview getting very cross because almost of course in the 15 minute longer journey to go home um, and I remember one one interviewer saying to me that that surely when we did the reintroduction in 1998 we should have made contingency plans for this uh, 20 years later and, and and we should have thought about this one as to how we might uh, manage it a bit better which I thought was slightly outrageous um, so yeah, I say it's, so. There, there, there can be kickbacks on some of these um, because, of course, with having dormice as a protected species, they have to be taken into consideration with the upgrading of the motorway to the smart motorway. And that's why, really. So uh, this was just off on bridges. Um, they're looking to make a smart motorway. So all the nice vegetation that, that the dormice are occupying has been cut down with a view of making that as a refuge area for vehicles. Uh, takes up quite a large area. And obviously they're destroying quite a large amount of dormouse habitat. Whether dormouse will survive in it, I don't know. Um, they still seem to be hanging on. I think the, it's due to finish in about two years time, but the, 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 there's, I mean, there's two positives out of this. If they do hang on to it, there'll be a really nice habitat left them at the end. And we've actually managed to get two dormouse bridges going across the M1, which is a first really. So uh, if they do survive, they potentially will have access to both sides of the motorway, um, which, which is quite exciting. So then in 2014, the, the program was reviewed by a chap called uh, Paul Channing, and his view was very much the strategy of the reintroduction program should change from one of expansion to one of consolidation, and the site should be clustered in small groups. Now, if you see that map of the, of the UK there, well, what he was proposing, that, that uh, instead of expanding and kind of reintroducing almost anywhere, we should concentrate on that red hatched area in his map, so kind of three large squares in that elliptical area, which is all very nice if you're writing the report, but I've already said that actually trying to find sites is the hardest part of the reintroduction program. And yet, if you start restricting the geographical area in which you can look for sites, of course, you're then making that problem an awful lot harder. So, a good idea in principle, um, but, but just a lot harder in practice. People's Trust for Endangered Species then, then commented on, on that and, and, and we decided to handle it that, that we give priority to sites in a priority county by ones that Paul identified. Where we've already done reintroductions, if we could find another site, we could try and do so. And when we did a reintroduction at a new site, we would need to, we would identify at least two woodlands um, so we could then actually do two reintroductions or a minimum of two reintroductions in two woodlands fairly close to each other and then look to link the landscape in between that. Again, um, lovely in principle and it's actually what we've managed to do and we can we continue to do it. That's kind of is what we're looking to do now. But again, it does make it much, much harder because you're not now looking for one nice woodland, you're actually looking for at least two within a relatively close proximity. So this is what it looks like now. You do a release in site A in year one. And then you do a release in, in site B in year two or year three, it doesn't really matter. Um, and then once the dormice have occupied those woodlands, they would then start dispersing out. They'll all go in very varying directions. But what you're hoping is that some actually do select the, the landscape or the hedgerows between the two woodlands. And the idea is obviously you're then those two populations meet 
um, and will create a larger meta population in the area and a larger meta population within our landscape is obviously much more robust than just a, a population within a woodland. So that, that was the idea and that, that's kind of where we are now. And actually the first one we did this with was actually a trust wall within Nottinghamshire in 2013. We've actually done a reintroduction in this wood, uh, I think it was 1995-96. We'd actually done a reintroduction in this wood um, long before my time, um, which I have to say failed. Uh, and I, I, if, I think it fell late because it was the very early stages of the reintroduction program. And it was at a time when Nottinghamshire Wildlife Trust, who owned this woodland, had, had literally just bought the woodland. And it was going through a transition period, uh, going through a transition from high forest to more of a coppice management, um, which ultimately would be good, great for dormice, but it's not particularly good to put dormice into a woodland that you're then in the process of cutting half, half of it down. So I think that was, that was probably the key problem, but there were other little issues as well. I think we, we certainly hadn't got the dormice stock sorted out very well. Um, a lot of the stock for the early reintroductions came from the, the channel tunnel work, um they were they, i don't we didn't have the quarantine process we have now um and we some of the individuals weren't particularly great to release and i think the population as a whole suffered as well and there's also a, a, another comment which i, I always tend to disagree with is um at one point the wildlife trust was actually using pigs to go in and clear bramble out so they could then manage some of the trees and that was used as a reason all the pigs were in there eating the dormice and I think if you've got a robust population in the woodland, um, I don't think a few pigs would be a great problem. They might eat a, few, eat a few dormice, but I think if you've got a robust population, it would hold up fairly well. I think the biggest problem was really the, the transition of the wood from in management styles really was, was the greatest problem. But anyway, we decided that it was suitable for a reintroduction in 2013. And just to give you an idea of kind of what happens at a reintroduction, all our dormice are all captive bred. So we've got about 12 captive breeders around the country that breed dormice for us. And then every year we get together, um, usually it's end of April, um, uh, which is a balance really, because you're trying to keep it late enough so that um, you don't have to dig dormice out of hibernation, which in April is a possibility. And you want to try and make sure you have enough time to get the quarantine period in. So it usually happens about late April and all the captive breeders meet at um, the venue for that year. This, this year it was the Zoological Society of London. Um, basically to, to kind of catch an update on uh, animal husbandry and, and, and animal welfare. Um, and also to then pass the animals over to um, the zoos so they can go into quarantine. <clears throat> so yeah, they get so one lot gets shipped across to, to London and go into to veterinary care there for six weeks, and the other so, and the other half go to um, Paynton Zoo down in Devon, and again to, to go into the, through a quarantine process down there. Meanwhile, up at the site, the selected site, there, there is work going on. So um, we are looking to get a number of these large cages that you see on the, yeah, on the uh, left hand side. So these are the soft release cages that the dormice will be put into when they go into the wood. Um, and so there's a, a large number of boxes need to go up as well. So we put in a high number of boxes because basically the dormice that we're putting out they will be very used to, to dormice boxes um, and they'll be, used to be very used to kind of I suppose less used to human activity, but they'll certainly be used to a, a certain diet. And what we're trying to do is make sure they can move and transition to a, a, a native or a wild diet as soon as possible. So whilst all the work's going on at uh, going into the quarantine, there's a lot of work going on at the site to make sure the cages are in place, to make sure boxes are in place, and to make sure there's a kind of team of volunteers that, that, that know what they're doing and, and can progress and check dormice once the, the reintroduction has actually taken place. I say lots of stuff going on. So this is uh, putting the cages up, um, heading down to putting those up, um, and even just putting those. There's 20 of those cages will go up because we look to release 40 uh, 40 dormice, 20 pairs. So we need at least 20 of those large cages up, uh, and I'll say about 200 boxes, um, which both will take um, a day or so to put up. So there's two or three days work really um, just to get the site prepared um, for dormice coming in. And also the other thing you need to be careful of as well, of course, is because you're putting we're basically going to be releasing dormice into these large cages. You want to try and make sure they're well out of public view because, in essence, you've got door this because this is the only going to be any dormice population in the country. People will be interested, and you've got dormice trapped in a cage for, for, for 10 days or so. 
So here they're putting up, putting them up it's kind of well out of the way, uh, trying to make sure that the cages have some shade, uh, fairly well secured onto the tree, uh, but also they need to be accessible because people have to get to them to feed them, um, which is another big part of the program. Again, in the first uh, 10 days, we'll, we'll feed dormice every day. So they do need to be accessible to pe people, but obviously the habitat also needs to be good that the dormice can, once they leave the cages, can kind of uh, start to occupy the woodland and get around. <coughs> So boxes going up, as I say, 200 boxes going in as well. Um, and these will then form the basis of the, the longer term monitoring. Once the soft release cages come down, um, these will continue to be checked uh, on a monthly basis to, to keep an eye on the dormant population. So we were lucky, really, with, I was just lucky is the wrong word perhaps, but having said that Treswell Wood went through a transition stage of going from a canopy woodland to a coppice woodland, I think from it where it was in 2000 or 1996, I should say, when the first reintroduction went in, as to what it, what it became in 2013, it was absually fantastic. It is, it is, it is almost perfect dormouse habitat. It's, it's a lovely woodland. Um, so I was very happy to do another reintroduction there, given that the habitat was, was pretty much spot on. Um, and the other thing you need for reintroductions, of course, is lots is volunteers, and they do generate a lot of interest. Reintroductions do generate an awful lot of interest, both from local volunteers um, that are keen to kind of see and get involved in the project, and also from media as well. Um, so this is we always have a media mouse at the reintroduction, so we bring one that's not going to be reintroduced. So this is my hand, my hand made it into the Times. Um, so there's always a, a number of journalists there wanting to talk about, wanting to talk about this sort of projects, because this stuff is quite exciting, really, in terms of you know, uh, a very enigmatic species going, going out into, into a new home. And this one we did, had um, filmed for the one show as well with Mike Gilger, which was, which was uh, quite a nice piece, actually. I, I was almost tempted to show it, but I actually thought that I'd, I'd pull through this one. Um, so yeah, it might, that was, that was uh, occupied most of my time, which is why we usually bring sort of two or three staff up. Um, and yeah, there's, there's, there's we, we, we try and get our own footage. There's a colleague of mine who I think is just suffering from a little, little bit of camera envy with the BBC being there as well. And obviously there's all the local stuff as well. So the Nottingham Post was, was talked about Dormice coming back in. Uh, and it, it, on, the, on the one hand, you're trying to keep the, the location a secret as possible, um, but on the other hand, obviously, this is a very good way of, of, of um, promoting dormice, and getting people enthusiastic about dormice, because I must admit, cons conservation is, is as much about people and engaging with people as it is about engaging and, and, and trying to do something with the species. So uh, the, the, the reintroduction program is probably one of the almost a highlight of the dormice year in terms of a way of promoting the species and kind of getting people excited about it. As I said, they, they provide, they're fed for um, uh, 10 days uh, daily, uh, and then after 10 days, a small opening is made in the, in the large release cage, and then the dormice are free to come and go. Um, but they continue to be fed, although the, 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 the food is slowly pulled back until about uh, late August, September, when we expect them to be, be um, uh, feeding on natural food and having kind of occupying, now occupying the, um, the woodland. So, uh, yeah, it's a lot of, lot of work for volunteers. So again, we want to make sure that, that, that when we do on the reintroduction day, there's a good balance between having people there that we kind of engage with, but not having too many, so we're not tripping over each other. And I must admit, Treswell was one of the first ones I'd done, and I think we, we probably pushed it out, pushed the cage out a bit far, because uh, I think we ended up with about a two kilometre walk around the woodland in the end, uh, which I think was probably a bit excessive. And um, we've tend to pull back a bit from that now on, on more recent ones. So these are the dormice that all turned up. They all look like they're sealed in their boxes. So there is a dormouse um, stud book. So we know the genetic, um, we know where the dormice came from. We know the genetic links from them. Um, so we make sure that the dormice aren't uh, aren't related and make sure that we get as good a genetic mix as, as possible. Um, so that that's, that's, is very carefully controlled. Um, this be these people sort of heading out to the woodland um, with a view of going and putting, putting dormice in the cages. Um, and this Gabby from ZSL uh, topping the cage up. So we'll put vegetation in the, in the cages so they've got something to run around on. And uh, also so they've, they've, um, they've got a bit of shading in the cage as well. And so as I say, it's all carefully tracked, it's all carefully notified, 
all dolomites that go out are also pit tags so we can identify them and see kind of uh, uh, try and try and pick up and see what happens to them as, uh, as we go through the uh, through the monitoring program and uh, yeah say so always good to to engage the volunteers so i think this is almost actually come out here that's what these people are looking at um surprisingly having the dormice having just traveled up from london and painted to uh, nottingham they seem quite happy to come out of the boxes and and uh, another bit of run, run around with the cage so yeah one of the dormice that uh, features there so that was the reintroduction to Treswell Woodland. I'd say that's 2013, and Treswell Woodland is the wood in the upper right-hand corner of, of my red area here. And we did for two further reintroductions in Gamston Wood and Eaton Wood, which are the two woodlands at the bottom corner of, uh, say, the red area. And the idea was to, to look to try and link up um, the landscape, link up the hedgerows uh, in between those two woods. So what the landscape looks like. So that, that wood in the distance is Treswell wood. And whilst it doesn't look particularly brilliant, you can kind of see it's, it's not too difficult seeing that you could restore that as a hedge landscape. So the local wildlife trust uh, went out and, uh, and did uh, some, a hedgerow survey for us. I think oh, that was with the group, the Dormas group as well, because one of the other things that happened on the back of the Nottingham reintroductions was we had the formation of the Nottingham Dormas group based on, um, on the three three reintroductions and i have to say it's a really successful group they're, they're, they're almost have to turn people away because there's there's so many people keen and, and wanting to get involved so that's been very encouraging as well and in terms of so what tends to happen is that the woodland trust owns certain woodland trust the wildlife trust owned all three woodlands um, so they tend to work with the landowner liaison and we're kind of lucky there's only three landowners that own those fields in the middle so that, that makes it a little bit easier uh, but all the practical work the Dormouse group do they kind of see that as one of the things that they want to do so and, and also the Dormouse group do do some of the work for the wildlife trust as well so this is something I picked up uh, uh, that they did I think a couple of years ago so they, they, they planted up or, or thinned done some of the woodland management work they've started gapping up some of the hedgerows um, and you can see some of the, the uh, yeah, it's a bit, a bit unfortunate that uh, gapped up hedge that they've got at the bottom was then then trashed by some by someone driving a four wheel four wheel drive vehicle over the um, over the field and driving over the hedge. I think it's now been repaired. So there is a lot of work going on. And it's um, from PTS's point of view, it hasn't been hugely expensive because there have been such a lot of local interest in kind of this, but it, it does seem to be going very, very well. And in terms of how well the door mice have kind of fared and what they're doing, well, the top map shows you um, Treswell Wood, that's, 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 the, uh, that's, the, that's Treswell Wood. And last year a dormouse was recorded uh, where you can see that yellow pin. So um, they are starting to shift out and they are starting to move and then move into areas beyond the woodland. And the other one even, uh, to me, a bit more exciting, the bottom picture shows Gamston Wood, which a reintroduction was done, I think it was, uh, must have been 2015. Um, well, they've now moved across, they've been recorded in Silcott Wood, which is that, that uh, area in yellow, they'll be recorded there. And that line next to Silcott Wood is actually the East Coast Main Line. And they're actually now being recorded on the side of the East Coast Main Line. And Network Rail are now getting very interested as to how they might manage sympathetically for dormice, which is brilliant because uh, I, I, I do start to think that actually uh, our woodland management generally is not great for dormice. So it actually could well be that roadside and rail side habitats have, have kind of become optimal dormouse habitat. Um, so the fact that, that um, dormice have now moved onto the East Coast mainland is, is, is brilliant news. So that's kind of where we are with Nottinghamshire. And I know I'm, um, I just want to very briefly go over a few other, other projects and so, but just in terms of other, other bits we're doing. This was another one we did in Wensleydale up in Yorkshire. Um, the exciting one to me about this was that a uh, rope paper that I mentioned at the start from the paper in 1885. They talk about dormice being in the Vale of Wensleydale. And we've done two reintroductions up there one at Freeholders Wood and one at Hallbank. And so what the landscape looks like, so not your obvious kind of um, uh, dormouse uh, habitat, but I suspect if they were there in 1885, it probably hasn't changed that much. Um, and there are kind of linear links, perhaps not what you expect in Surrey, but nonetheless, um, there's potential enough to do something here with dormice. People's Trust for Endangered Species and, and, and one or two others funded a project here, a three-year project here, to look to try and link those landscapes. 
and this is what the, the group achieved. So they, they, they ensured the minimum of 2.1 kilometers of existing hedgerow brought into management. They planted up almost 2k of hedgerow. They managed 10, or managed 10 small wooded areas for dormice. So again, this is a, a project on the back of, of the introductions. Um, I think this one's just now, has now just come to an end. Also doing something similar in Warwickshire. We've done two reintroductions there as well. And this was this is now part of a, a lottery bid as part of a living landscapes project um, to look to how do we link the, these woodlands. Um, so that's another one of all mice kind of going to the woodlands actually uh, helping or aiding in the local landscape. So this was, this was part of a one and a half million pound heritage lottery fund bid. Um, the doormat reintroduction was pretty central to that project. Um, and we have a five-year science project there as well, pit tagging or continually pit tagging draw dormice. This is this is nothing to do with the uh, reintroductions, but it's a similar type project. This is actually down in the Tess Valley in, near Andover in uh, Hampshire, and again similar type thing. Looking for door, this is looking for dormice populations though on on landowners, uh, and again they've contacted a lot of landowners mapped uh, 25 kilometers of hedgerows, surveyed a number of woodlands. But the, the point I think is interesting in this one is they did a questionnaire to all the, the local landowners. About a quarter of them were interested in gapping up existing hedges. Um, a hundred percent were interested in knowing if they had dormice on the land and what they might do to help dormice get there. And uh, it's kind of three quarters of them were interested in, in looking at hedgerow management or knowing about woodland management for dormice. So you've actually got the people, farmers really wanting to kind of have dormice on the land. They see it as real value. Um, and finally, then, really, in terms of, I suppose, what, what can you take out of the, the dormice reintroduction program? It's been running since 1993. Um, I declared it was cheap once and I got laughed at, but it is cheap in terms of no one body pays a huge amount of money. So people's trust for endangered species, obviously are probably the, one of the biggest contributors to it. Natural England contribute. ZSL do the quarantine, but they get that funding from, from um, other money they have. Paintings are self-funding, they, they, they fund the quarantine themselves. The Common Dormus Captive Breeders Group is all self-funding. And all the receptor, the receptor sites, what we we'll work on at receptor sites is generally self-funding as well. So, so no one party pays a big sum um, to the reintroduction program. And this this was came up from a, from someone who leads on the IUCN reintroduction committee, and his view was, and I must admit, I would certainly agree with these sentiments. Reintroductions are difficult; they are hard to do. There's an awful lot of people involved. It's a difficult thing to do. Um, and, and it's not something you can really take, uh, you, can, you can undertake lightly. And also most fail, most, most don't work. I mean, we've, a lot of the, the, the dormouse ones have failed for, for a variety of reasons, but predominantly it's because the woodland management that had been promised uh, has not been undertaken. Um, but also dorm, the reintroductions kind of aren't the answer to a lot of the conservation or species problems we, we're facing at the moment. Um, they're a tool that we can use um, and they're worth doing is they're worth trying, but they are expensive, they're hard and most fail. So it's certainly not the, something that will solve all the problems in the conservation world, but, but certainly something worth consider, considering. The Joe Mass um, reintroduction program is considered a success. It was uh, it featured in the UK six reports to the um, the biodiversity um, the convention on uh, biodiversity doctorate, um, which was was quite nice from my point of view. We don't know whether climate change will have an impact. It's possible. Um, in which case, if we get almost further north, will the climate be a little bit more stable a bit further north? Um, who knows? But if we if we kind of close the reintroduction program down, we'll never know because it'll be very expensive to start it back up again. Process of sites of of, um, of site selection is, is fairly random. People tend to come to us. We simply don't have the resources to to go out seeking sites. So it would be quite nice to see if we could improve that, but it's difficult to to, to see how we could. And I've, as I've kind of alluded to, reintroductions aren't just about dormice. They can promote various other things, such as funding, volunteers, academic research, partnerships, and, and also there are real media opportunities as well. And I think that that's actually um, quite exciting and actually very good to kind of promote the species. So I suppose uh, as a summary then, reintroduction won't reverse the dormice decline. But the thing that I think is most exciting, and it came out of the Test Valley project, and it also came out of the Wensleydale project, that dormice as a species 
can encourage farmers to change how they manage their hedgerows. And so dormice, as I say, as a species, it basically can drive landscape change. And I've never particularly liked the idea of gardening for a single species. I don't like the idea of saying, well, well, actually, we, we dormice are the be all and end all, we've got to look after them. But dormice are fabulous indicators of good quality scrubby habitat that's so beneficial to woodland birds, woodland butterflies, woodland bats. And if we get it right for dormice, we're going to get it right for an awful lot of other things as well. So I think that's, that was my lot. Um, I'm going to, if I, no, I'm going to, I'm going to stay sharing because that's quite a nice, 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 uh, nice point to end on. Um, so if anyone has any questions, I'd be very happy to answer. Thank you very much, Ian. That was fantastic. Um, I'll speak more when we've had some questions. Um, anybody got some questions? Anybody got any questions for Ian? He's covered such a lot of ground. I'm sure there must be some things. Let me just um, make sure I can see everybody a minute. Uh, if you've got a question, just simply unmute yourself and chip in because I'm. This is not my normal screen. Hang on a moment. Significant is the presence of um, hazel in re reintroduction programs. Does there need to be an awful lot of it? And <laughs> as well. Um, as, as the short answer is not. Uh, I mean, for example, um, and I suppose a, a, a video I was looking at the other day, actually, I, I do get involved in, uh, in uh, ecological or mitigation work as well for dormice. And I reviewed a, in fact, it's the other way around. I got sent a video by a, a homeowner who had, a, a, had got a, a bird feeder in his garden. And he basically filmed four dormice on this bird feeder. And he came back to me and said, look, I've just filmed this, clearly dormice. Can you just confirm dormice? And, 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 and he said, yeah, the, the chap next door actually wants to develop. And he's had an ecological report done. And they've looked at the hedgerows and said, insufficient hazel, dormice need hazel. Um, so actually, we're going to assume there's no, no dormice present here at all. And then he sent me a video with four dormice in his hedge. Um, I did take the liberty to phone up the consultant and say, I'm actually going to have to for inform the planning department about this because you're clearly wrong. Um, but no, do hazel is not vital. I mean, hazel, the, the association of dormice with hazel is, a, it's, it is a very good habitat for them. I, I, it, 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 it's, it's very good for a number of reasons. Um, but one of the reasons there is that close association is that um, hazel was a crop uh, it, was a, it was a crop that was cut by coppice workers. Um, and of course, um, agricultural workers would be out working in the fields over the summer and they would come in and they would cut the hazel over winter, which is when dormice were hibernating from the ground, so they would find dormice. I have heard it said that perhaps dormice should be called blackberry mouse because actually they occur just as readily in blackberry. But of course, no one cuts blackberry. No one cuts bramble in a way that you would find, find dormice in it. So no... Um, Hazel is not essential by any means. Um, what to me is the most important thing, I think they're probably more flexible in their diet than we perhaps we give them credit for. And I think by far and away, the most important thing is the arboreal connectivity. If you don't have that arb arboreal connectivity, you don't have that interlinking of branches, um, that's when dormice are going to struggle to occupy areas or struggle to disperse. Thank you, Ian. That was really interesting reply to that. Any more questions from anybody else? Anybody else? Um, yes, I have, I have a question um, for Ian. Um, you talk about the um, really interesting talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, but I, what, what else do you do with your job? You briefly um, mentioned the mitigation and Stuff like that, but what else are you doing to kind of help dormice? Really, <laughs> well, uh, I know it's, kind of, it's a really it's, simple question, but you know, it kind of concerns me. Re reintroduction is quite difficult, which I can understand, and um, because of the loss of habitat, etc. Um, but is there anything else we could like? We have a, gr a huge uh, banks of bramble around us. Is could they not live in there and you there's, know there's there's no, uh, well 
if they could get there, there's no doormats in Leicestershire. Yes. Um, we almost right. did a re- yeah. we almost did yeah. a reintroduction in Rutland, but that was a few years ago. But it got cancelled, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> the, I have to say, the difficulty is is in terms of um, I can only could only actually talk about one element. Ironically, I've just actually finished a uh, two day training course. I actually run a three-day course on door mice talking about what we do, talking about just this. Um, so so okay. what I managed to talk about is one element of what I do. Um, yes. The way, if I could give you a, an overview, when do, I've talked about door mice being highly protected, um, door mice became a bat species uh, in 1998, I think it was. So a bat species, which some of you may be familiar with, was a biodiversity action plant species. And what biodiversity action plans were, I, I really liked them, uh, to be honest. It meant that you could come up with a strategy at multiple levels in terms of how you might manage, conserve, call it what you would look after a species. So from a, you, could, you could have a national BAP, you could have a county BAP, you could have a regional BAP, you could come down to a parish BAP. The national BAP for dormice, when it was written, was to maintain dormice where we knew where, where they were, to enhance populations where we could and to reintroduce where they become extinct. That were the three features of the national bat. So in terms of if you think of something like maintain, uh, well maintain means to maintain or much you need to say, well actually, what's our survey tools like? Um, how do we improve our survey techniques to, to identify where door mice are? And you need to see about improving habitat. Mm-hmm. So those things we have, have action. One is that we've just fund, we funded two years ago, we funded some research in Suffolk to come up with a new method of surveying dormice, which I think is quite exciting using footprint tunnels. So that is now pretty much going through the new dormice mitigation handbook as a survey technique because it's a lot more statistically robust. Um, woodland management, I spend probably, I hate to think how much time I spend trying to think about ways that how do you encourage landowners, how do you engage with the likes of Network Rail, the likes of Highways England. It's all very nice. I can talk about what I want to be done or what should be done to help dormice and other species, but implementing it is an entirely different thing. Actually getting it done is really difficult. Um, so that's one I'll maintain. On enhance is to me is kind of looking at the fragmentation issue, how to improve things, how can you do, or how can you improve planting on um, new woodlands, and how might you improve hedgerow management? Well, and we did a study in 2015 looking at how might we test an arboreal structure for door to, to prove that door mice would use it. That is now commercially available, and that is forms two bridges over the M1 that is basically that now we can start getting small arboreal bridges for mammals across motorways, which I think is quite exciting. Um, we've actually taken on the DEFRA hedgerow survey <laughs> to look oh. to and pick up the, the hedgerow connectivity to landscape scale and changed it so that people going out and doing hedgerow surveys can now feed back to the landowner and say, well, this is what you need to do to get your hedgerow in, into a good condition. And also, obviously, we do reintroduction. So, yeah, there, there are a lot of other elements and there's a lot of other things we do do, um, basically. And, and yeah. I suppose, I mean, so I've, been, I've been working with PTS for 2006 um, and I've, I've always run training courses, but I have been absolutely, have, I think blown away is, is, is not too, uh, is probably a reasonable statement. Um, the course I ran, to, uh, it was, uh, yes, Monday and Tuesday this week, had 60 people on it. Um, that filled up in three weeks. Uh, we then booked another one for, to for, for a fortnight's time. That's then filled up. We've made another one go in, in um, I think it's about three weeks after that. And I've already got 10 people on that. So they fill up at the moment. I'll have trained over 210 people on a two day, on a two, and basically a, a one day dormouse course, which I think is quite remarkable. Yeah, so it's great. I think if we want to kind of get the message out there that you know dormice are important, we need mm-hmm. to kind of do something and, and engage. Then, uh, then yeah, there seems to be a lot of interest. Yeah, that's great. Thank you very much. That's great. <laughs> thank and, you, uh, thank you, and I've got a question first of all from Nicola, and then I've got one from John. So, Nicola, would you like to go next? Yes, thank you very much, Ian. Um, I'm not very knowledgeable. Can you explain to me what pit tagging is that you okay. do for dormice? Um, do you have a dog or a cat? Yeah. Okay. Well, I did have. It's, it's the small tags you'd put into a a dog, 
um, to basically identify if, if anything happens to your dog, to basically identify your so it's like the microchipping dog. for dog. Yeah. Yes, it's microchipping. But yes, it's obviously for dormice, it's much, much smaller. <laughs> it's a highly invasive technique, but it can give you huge amounts of information. Um, it's a nightmare managing and organising all that side, but it can give you huge amounts of information in terms of, um, of identifying the dormice. But it doesn't give you live tracking? Um, I don't think it does at the moment. I think it's getting close to that. Mm -hmm. We actually talked of, I mean, the difficulty with anything dormouse wise, I have to say, is you're looking at populations, A, that, well, you're looking at an animal that's very, very small oh, um, yes. and, um, and lives at very low population densities. Mm -hmm. So one of the thoughts has been, well, actually, what you could do if you're using nest boxes, you could put automatic tag readers around the collar of nest boxes, which you could do. But if you've got 100 boxes up in the wood, which one do you put collars around? Because they're 45 or 50 pound a pot, they're quite expensive. <laughs> oh, yeah. They could likely get nicked in a woodland. It's, it's the practical of all this stuff. It's, it's, there's a oh, lot yeah. you could do. It's the practical implications of it. Okay. The other thing is, um, you mentioned that we haven't got any dormice in Leicestershire, but are there any of those wildlife corridors that are heading towards Leicestershire in adjacent counties, obviously? Hmm. Good question. So uh, like, like Warwickshire, I mean, I know the bit you showed was south east of Coventry, but are there any other areas that hmm. struggle? It's quite sparse around Coventry. There's a reintroduction site near Coventry. In fact, that's where the, the Warwickshire ones are. The problem is, you would think, I should ask those if anyone works for Highways England on that network rail, but you would think, wouldn't you, that given the amount of work that gets done on, on major road sites, and the amount of ecological surveys that get undertaken on roadsides. I, I naturally thought when I first started investigating that there would be some sort of ecological database held by, national, by Highways England out Network Rail that they put all their information in and would have a really good idea of the amount of work done on a broad range of species, but obviously my interest in dormice, in terms of what surveys they've completed, where they'd found dormice, where they hadn't, and it'd all be fairly simple and straightforward. It doesn't exist. None of that exists at all. So there's no upper, there, and so negative surveys aren't reported. So we've got no upper bound on, we're only looking at positive records and potentially the positive records of survey methodologies have been such that may not always be as reliable as we'd like. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, and we've got, no, we've got no upper bound on that. So it might well be that they are heading quite happily up the motorway network, but we just don't know about it. Lovely. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm hoping they are. I mean, to be honest, we have been asked by Natural England to put together a protocol to, to look at a baseline survey data to see if we can identify where they are elsewhere in the country. Um, that, to me, that's an obvious corridor. If they were expanding anywhere, I think that's where they'd be expanding, up the, up the road network, up the rail network. What about up the water network, up, up, up the canals? Yeah, exactly the same. Any of these linear networks with kind of with scrubby margins that bound them, yeah. And the other one is, is Sustrans is another obvious one. Um, but the, key, the reason I'm keen on network rail and uh, Highways England is you've only got one ownership for management. So it's easier to, to control and, and the management, basically. Yes, I just thought the Canal and River Trust might be more amenable. Yeah, yeah. No. To, to I, haven't, I haven't got into them yet, but no, absolutely agree. Absolutely agree. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ian. I think John has got a question now. John, over to you. Thank you. Um, thanks for the talk, Ian. I, I enjoyed it immensely. Um, if I can point you in one direction, we have an area of eastern Leicestershire and western Rutland, which, to be frank, is tailor-made for a reintroduction programme, simply because it's the remnants of the old Lyfield Forest. And we have contained now several really high quality woodlands, Lawns Park Wood, Lawn Big Wood, Ooston Wood, Skeffington Wood, and I can go on. And it's an area that isn't intensively farmed by arable farming. And the hedgerows, by and large, because of the hunting tra tradition, are in extremely good condition. And it would seem to me that that is a wonderful place for a reintroduction programme mm -hmm. along the lines that you've described. And even more so since I believe the last dormouse to be seen in Leicestershire was seen by a friend of mine in Ooston Wood in the late 40s, early 50s. So I wonder whether that's an area that you might consider for a reintroduction programme in the future. To be honest, I'm always happy to consider areas. Um, and so I manage the programme. It's just what we're waiting for is actually people come to us and, and suggest areas like you have. And 
uh, again, because there's just me managing, pretty much kind of managing much of Dormouse like conservation um, across the UK is in terms of we kind of need to come back with the, the, site, the site owners. Um, and and if, if you think it would be appropriate, then yeah, I'll generally be very happy. Well, I mean, it, two of those woods are jewels in the crown of the Leicestershire and Rutland Wildlife Trust. Mm. Um, and one of the big woodlands, Ooston Wood, where the last Dormouse was seen, um, that is in one the hands of one private owner, um, there are several fragments of this ancient woodland left. And to me, it would be the most sensible place to try a program fairly soon. Mm. Uh, yeah, I mean, to be honest, there are, there are the limitations usually are, of course, uh, A, we can only do one reintroduction a year. Um, and so, so it, does take, it does take time. But, even if that, if that, but that means at times, even if the management isn't right at the moment, there is end of time to get, get it in. And I'm, and I'm always interested. I'm always, I, I try and have a, um, a number of woods kind of up my sleeve uh, to re to, for, for potential reintroductions if we can do them. Um, so can, no, I suggest, you know, can I suggest that you approach the Leicestershire and Rutland Wildlife Trust? Uh, yeah, that's a good argument. I'm happy, happy to drop them a line and, uh, and, and, and take the suggestions out. Yes, by all means. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Thank you for asking that question, John, because I think that both me and Richard were sitting here wondering exactly the same. That's really good. Thank you. Are there any more questions from anybody? I can't see anybody else with a raised hand. Um, does anybody else just want to unmute themselves and jump in? Mm, no. In that case, I think we'll um, we'll wind up for this evening. Um, Ian, I'm, thank you so much for that talk. Uh, you covered so much ground. I think you've given us all a really good understanding of the way the whole project around dormice dormice works. The the sort of scientific background, the logical thinking, the way forward, the problems. It's been really, really interesting evening. And I think we've all come away from it understanding a lot more about it. And I'm sure most of us here would really love it if we could get a, um, a project going in Leicestershire. And I'm absolutely certain amongst the people that you've got on the screen tonight, you would find there would be no problem with volunteers in Leicestershire. <clears throat> there is a lot of volunteering done in Leicestershire, so I'm sure you would have lots of people prepared to help you if we could get it off the ground. Thank you very much indeed for that. So um, with that, I, I'd like to say just uh, everybody, I'll speak on behalf of everybody, thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Well, well, you're certainly very welcome. And I say thank you for the suggestion. I say normally we... Um, yeah, we, as I say, we don't have the resources to go out seeking sites, so having suggestions of sites is always very useful. Can't promise anything very uh, immediately, but, but certainly it's always very useful knowing where other sites are. And, uh, and, uh, and from my point of view, it's, it's looking to try and get to visit it at some point. But it sounds like the contacting the Wildlife Trust is, is the first port of call. Yeah, thank you. Um, I've just had another message from Nicola. She's asking if you could um, let us have the information, the link for your training sites, for your training courses. I mean, if you could email me with them, I could forward it to Nicola um, or anybody yeah, else. Yeah, certainly. Um, yeah, no problems. I can do that. Yeah. Bormies. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. Okay. Well, if anybody else has got anything to say, speak up now. Otherwise, I think we'll close this evening and I look forward to seeing you at the next meeting uh, next week.